The Tom Woods Show, episode 781. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like a lot of people, your email inbox is taking over your life. Well, reclaim your life and your sanity with SaneBox.com, which I use myself. Get a 14-day free trial at SaneBox.com slash Woods. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. Talking to Scott Horton today because we're talking about foreign policy. We're doing kind of a bird's-eye overview of foreign policy, some hot spots around the world, and thinking in terms of what Donald Trump, as the incoming U.S. president, should be hearing from his own advisors. What kind of briefing should he be given? Well, it would be the kind of information that you would hear, that you'll be hearing in this particular episode. Now, before I get to Scott Horton, let me tell you about something extremely important that I'm doing this month, November 2016. You know I have a website called libertyclassroom.com, very popular among libertarians, and I'm having an affiliate contest. Now, I have an affiliate program where you join it, I send you a special link that's tied to you, and if you post this link on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, and somebody clicks through and joins my site, you get a 50% commission because I know that you referred the person. Well, during the affiliate contest, not only do you get the 50% commissions, but if you're one of my top 10 affiliates, you get an additional prize. The top prize is a brand new car. Prizes 2 through 10 are all cash prizes totaling $5,000. Now, most people listening to this are not going to do anything. So you have an excellent chance to win that car, vastly better than any car giveaway you've ever seen before. Vastly better, because most people will not take action. So if you get out there and promote Liberty Classroom during this promotion, you have an excellent chance to win one of these prizes. So get the details at woodscontest.com. And I'm telling you, you have an excellent, excellent chance to win one of these prizes. Now, if money doesn't matter to you, then don't go to woodscontest.com. But during the four days of that contest, you should expect to see your pockets get stuffed with affiliate commissions. So check out woodscontest.com. Now, Scott Horton is the host of The Scott Horton Show that you can check out at scotthorton.org. He's also the host of Anti-War Radio on 90.7 KPFK in Los Angeles. And he is managing director of the Libertarian Institute over at libertarianinstitute.org. Scott, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tom. Good to talk to you again. All right. Look, it's like Trump week or something over here because now we're going to do the episode in which we brief him as if he were listening, right? The sorts of things you would want to say. It doesn't even have to be Trump in particular. Just whoever, just imagine a situation where there's a brand new president elected and you've got to sum up what's going on around the world. And I'm going to give you a country or a region and you're going to talk about it, where things stand and what ought to be done. Now, of course, what ought to be done is always some form of disengagement and so on. But we want to make the case for why that's the right thing to do. So let's jump right in. I will get to countries other than Middle Eastern ones because I think we should say something primarily about Russia. In fact, that would be the main place I'd want to go. But let's start with Iran because Trump has been saying that, you know, we've got these terrible trade deals, but we also have this terrible Iran deal. He says it's one of the worst deals ever made. And I'm not exactly sure what he's gone on record as saying he would do. I know Ted Cruz said he'd tear it up on the first day. I don't think Trump has said that, but he's very, very unfavorable toward it. So what would you tell him about Iran? Hmm. Well, yeah, first of all, I would say that um, I, I, at least at one point, I'm not sure how many times I heard him say this, Tom, but he has said that, well, a deal is a deal, and Obama made it, and he shouldn't have made it, but as long as it's a deal, I'm going to enforce it, and I'll enforce it like a hawk, and Hillary had basically said the same thing, that, you know, they're, and I don't think that he really implied that he meant to sabotage it and see it fail either. I think he said, you know, we'll see what happens with it. But so then the good news there is the deal is great. The deal is so awesome. The deal is they had this civilian nuclear program that sort of amounted to a breakout capability, which meant it was basically a latent nuclear weapons deterrent. 
they had a program that could have been converted into a bomb program and could have produced nuclear weapons. Now their civilian program, which was always safeguarded and inspected all along, now their program has been so scaled back that it's nowhere near breakout capability. They don't even have enough uranium on hand that if they did enrich it up to weapons grade, it would even be enough for a single bomb. And they've scaled down you know, uh, some of their facilities. They turned off one reactor. They converted another to light water so it'll only produce very polluted plutonium waste that won't be uh, fissile material. And they've expanded inspections beyond all reason, beyond all historical precedent, and they've swore to never make nuclear weapons as a as a, that's a part of the deal that never expires. That they have swore as a matter of policy they'll never seek nukes. And truthfully and honestly, and I've read Gareth Porter and all the rest of them, and there really is no evidence they ever had a weapons program. There was some research done into nuclear weapons, but they never had a a, a program to actually develop an atom bomb ever. And so uh, the deal really. The reason people hate it so much, I don't know about Donald Trump, but the reason everybody he's trying to impress with that line hates it so much is because it takes war off the table. Because this fake nuclear weapons threat, or at, at worst, this latent, you know, could be nuclear capability, was their best hope for an excuse for a war of regime change to get rid of the Ayatollahs. So that's why they're all upset. And that's why if you read Daniel Larison at the American Conservative Magazine, he has great fun completely destroying every single bogus accusation against Iran on the question of their nuclear program. And um, so I would just tell Donald Trump, you know, the deal is great. The money that we gave him was their money anyway. And, you know, we bribed, we, we made them uh, give us our sailors back for the money we were already paying them anyway. And by yeah, the well, way, well, wait, 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 well by, let, me, let me do it, by the way. Right. Yeah, so what was that whole thing about, about, oh, and Obama gave them all these billions of dollars. What, what was, what's that really about? Yeah, so now that was a previous deal. That actually wasn't related to the nuclear deal itself of a year ago that was a previous deal that was money that was seized i don't know if it was by jimmy carter or by ronald reagan i guess by jimmy carter back after the iranian revolution in 1979 uh, or in 1980 and it was money that they had paid the u.s for a weapons deal and the u.s then just seized the money and held it all along and then there was some process i don't I don't believe it was the world court, but it was one of these world courts of settlement of this, that, the other thing that had worked out and America had basically settled and come to the agreement that we were going to give them this money back. And that was separate. And in fact, that may have even happened under the Bush administration where that agreement was struck that they were going to get this money back. But it was their money. And then at the last minute, they added an extra condition. If you want your money that we're giving you anyway, you got to let our sailors go right now. Which, of course, you know, raises the question of how did they get our sailors? Well, our sailors were screwing around in the Persian Gulf on some little, I don't know if it was special forces, but they were in small boats and it was an Iranian island and Iranian waters where they weren't supposed to be. Whether they were on a spy mission, whether they were sent there deliberately to get caught in order to try to create some dissension by one faction or another inside the government, I don't know. Could have been, they said, you know, it was just a navigation accident. But they were only held overnight, and they released pictures of them with juice boxes and apples and smiles, and they were all treated perfectly fine. And in fact, it was, and you remember when I was pitching you the nuclear deal um, on the show at the time, and people were saying, well, what about all American prisoners in Iran and shouldn't they be part of the deal? And I was saying, if that's really a concern, then let's get this deal done. And that will be the basis of a new and better diplomatic relationship with Iran and we can get on with the hostages. Well, what happened? That's exactly what happened. John Kerry became buddies with uh, 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 Zarif, I forget his name, uh, first name, uh, Mohammed Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran. And so... He, as part of the deal in the background, they had a secret sub negotiation for the prisoners, just like in the accusations that they weren't doing. They were doing that. And then, right as the deal was coming through, the sailors got captured. Kerry picked up the phone, said, I sure would like to have my sailors back. And they said, Yeah, and, and you guys can get that money a little sooner for us, huh? And he said, All right. And so, deal was struck, which is 
a success unless you prefer war. That's, uh, you know, absolutely progress. And and yet I think also when I was on your show, Tom, I warned that, well, I warned somebody if it wasn't you, that even though this deal in and of itself is great, the Saudis might freak out. And that is what happened. That's what has helped lead to the war in Yemen is the Saudis are flipping out over their role in our order in the Middle East. Let's talk about um, a particular person, actually, before we go on to any other country. Sure. I'm, I'm hearing that John Bolton, which I, we've already known Trump has said nice things about, John Bolton may be part of the Trump team in some form or another, mm-hmm. possibly as ambassador to the U.N. What would you tell him about John Bolton? Well, I would tell him about John Bolton that Bolton is only half right. You know, the U.N. is a problem to the degree that it gets us into trouble and obligates the United States to intervene, quote unquote, obligates the U.S. to intervene in other people's affairs. And so, you know, the problem with John Bolton, uh, Mr. President, is that he gets the the whole criticism of the U.N., the, the, the traditional right wing criticism of the U.N. upside down. And he just simply says. They're in my way. I want to start a war, and I don't want to have to ask permission from the Russians, the French, and the Chinese on the Security Council before I start one. And so that's the current right-wing nationalist and neoconservative sort of opposition to the United Nations. And, you know, it's really a perversion of it's, – it's, it's a funhouse mirror version of what Ron Paul would say about how it's a threat to our independence. And, in fact, it helps us threaten the independence of everybody else in the world too. So that's what's wrong with it. And um, so John Bolton is not a neocon. He's a lifelong uh, right-wing nationalist. I think, you know, starting with the Goldwater years or whatever it is. He's not a former communist like a lot of these neocons, but he absolutely is blood brothers with them and has been, you know, for at least since the 70s, has been best buddies with them. And in the George W. Bush years, he was a major force in what Colin Powell called Dick Cheney's separate government that he created. And this is a huge part of the story, how they got us into Iraq was Dick Cheney had a few guys here and a few guys here and a few guys here and a few guys here in all of the different departments and all of the best places in on the staff and the Congress and this kind of thing. And so, you know, he called Scooter Libby and Scooter Libby made the government move in ways that nobody had ever really been able to do that before. And, uh, and drove Powell nuts and Bolton and David Wormser were that were Cheney's two guys that he had sent to the State Department to keep a leash on Colin Powell and his right hand man Dick Armitage, who was more loyal to Powell and his interests, and um, so uh, and he's also they call him the classic kiss up kick down kind of guy who always picks on his subordinates and sexually harasses all the women who work for him, and you can just tell by looking at him on, you know, blabbing on Fox News with all his belligerent BS what a scumbag he is. You know, he'll sit there and tell you on and on and on about how powerful Iran is in the region now, and of course they never say, yeah, but that's your fault, right? You're the guy who lied us into war against Saddam Hussein for Iran, and you know, I guess I don't know what he would answer that. He'd probably admit it. He's a frank talking enough guy. He'd probably say, yeah, that much is true, but still. But he's a dangerous guy. I wouldn't make him any kind of diplomat. That's for sure. Yeah. OK. Well, I think we all feel that way about him. It's just unbelievable that anybody would want to have anything to do with this guy at this point. But let's talk about another place here and let's go. I'm going to give you a couple that I know you could do a whole episode on, but let's no one's going to expect me to talk about Yemen. But I know you want to do an episode on Yemen. Give me the two-minute briefing because that's all you'd have. T- that's all Trump would give you. That's true. You two, two minutes to tell me about Yemen and what I should or should not do there. Ready, go. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mr. President. Uh, Saudi Arabia is no ally of the USA, and everything horrible going on in Yemen is all Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's fault. And the fact is, as soon as Obama came into power, he started bribing, he and Hillary, his secretary of state, started bribing the dictator of the country so that they could bomb al-Qaeda with drones. He took all the money and guns we gave him, and he picked a fight with the Houthis up in the north, which four different wars against them made them more and more powerful each time that he picked a fight with them and lost. Well, then the Arab Spring came, and... There was a, a huge movement to overthrow Saleh, was his name, the previous dictator, and Hillary intervened, 
and she eased him out and replaced him with the vice president and held a one-man fake election. Literally, if you type in hottie ballot in your Google images, it'll come right up. There's one man and one name on the ballot. And Hillary uh, said this was the advent of democracy or the advance of democracy in Yemen. And the problem with that is everybody hated Hadi. And Saleh, the former dictator, he took a bunch of army divisions with him when he left. And guess what? He went and made an alliance with the, his old enemies, the Houthis. Then they came down out of the north and tackled the, uh, you know, captured the capital city and kicked Hadi, the new guy, out of power. And this was in the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. And then Saudi Arabia launched a war. And Barack Obama helped him do it. And he's been helping him do it all day, every, every day since then, for 20 months now. And this is the poorest country in the Middle East, or in the Arab world anyway. I don't know, Somalia across the strait there. But um, it's an incredibly poor country. They are, have uh, been for a long time very dependent on foreign uh, food imports. Uh, because of, you know, previous international monetary fund shenanigans and, and who knows what from before that. Um, and so there's just massive famine. And the Saudis are deliberately bombing civilian targets. I talked to a reporter from Rolling Stone, Matthew Akins, and he's a solid reporter, Rolling Stone aside, I promise, um, from other venues too. And he went and he just saw where the Saudis were just devastating civilian targets in the northern towns where the Houthis were based out of and bombing marketplaces and bombing businesses and factories and, and civilian targets all over the place, hospitals. They just recently bombed a massive funeral, killed three or four hundred people, including uh, all different leaders of different factions who could have been available to negotiate and reconcile. And they were all slaughtered. And the whole thing is abetted by the U.S. Because, first of all, we sell them and give them the planes. But also, it's American contractors who are over there doing all the maintenance. It's American spies, military and civilian, and contractors probably too, who are doing the intelligence and helping them pick their targets. And then it's also American guys who are even helping them with their planes and programming in the coordinates to their targets and all that. And I have heard, Tom, from two different very credible sources that American pilots even sit in the back seats of these F-15s and hold the Saudi prince's little hands all the way to their war crimes where they go and fly. Oh, and when they stop and do refueling, mid-air refueling uh, from American planes, and plus our ships, the U.S. Navy is helping enforce the blockade there. So this is exactly what Russia is doing to Syria right now, right? Bombing a bunch of civilians and provoking a bunch of crocodile tears on TV for them. And yet that's America's policy right now. And I swear that this is true. Anybody go Google it. It's the official version of the history of this story, according to the newspaper of record, the New York Times. The story was no expose. It came from the Obama people. And they said they only did this to placate the Saudis, quote, placate the Saudis after the Iran deal, which secures Saudis' interests. It makes extra double super sure that the, Sa that the Iranians aren't making nuclear bombs. And the Saudi military is much more powerful than the Iranian one. They have the advantage in every way. And here we're securing their interests, but they don't like it. And so to make it up to them, Obama helps them launch a whole other war and a war whose mission is to put Hadi back in power, which is a absolute scientific impossibility, cannot, will not, shall not ever happen. And then we give them nothing but diplomatic cover to just keep the war going and keep the war going, no matter how much people in the U.N. and everywhere else call them to come to some kind of ceasefire. So it's a, at this point, it's a war without out end, 20 months and counting. And why are we doing this? No good reason. And look, we're fighting as at the same time the CIA is drone bombing Al-Qaeda, the rest of the Air Force is flying as their Air Force. We are, our U.S. guys are, are and, you know, working with the Saudis and the rest of this alliance are fighting for Al-Qaeda against the Houthis. And you know what? I talked as bad about Rand on this show as any other time, I should say. Rand Paul really did a great thing and tried very hard to stop the most recent arms sale to Saudi over this war. And he said on TV, Rand Paul, not Ron, Rand Paul said on TV, hey, Wolf Blitzer or Jake Tapper or whichever it was, hey, man, 
if we do, if we keep this up, we might put Al Qaeda in power in the capital city of Sanaa. Do you understand? This must stop right now. And that is not hyperbole. That is absolutely the danger of what's going on here. You could call it high treason if you want to, because that's what it is. I want to move over to Russia in just a minute, but let's first thank our sponsor. Folks, I get an avalanche of email every day. I got to figure out how to deal with this. And the only way I've been able to cope with it is by using SaneBox. SaneBox sorts out my email. It figures out what's important and what's less important. And that way I can read what I need to read right away and I can look at everything else at my leisure. Or if I can't deal with this email right now, rather than leaving it there and putting a yellow star next to it and then having to go back and find all the yellow stars, I can just have SaneBox send it to me tomorrow or send it to me in three days or whenever I'm ready to deal with it. Or if there's an email from somebody I'm sick and tired of hearing of or whatever, I can put it in the black hole folder, never hear from that person again. All kinds of great features like this, and they're going to allow you to get your life back. Well, check it out for free for 14 days at SaneBox, that's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com, SaneBox dot com slash Woods. And if you do go on to get a subscription, you'll automatically get $25 off as a Tom Woods Show listener. SaneBox.com slash Woods. All right. Now, again, bearing in mind, we can't not only can we do an entire episode on Russia, you've asked to do an episode on Russia. We haven't done it yet. Again, bearing in mind, we're just thinking in terms of a quick briefing. Yeah. Obviously, Trump's instincts are in favor of working out some kind of arrangement with Russia. Mm -hmm. And there are always there's there's already been a kind of an overture to him from Russia where there is some feeling that maybe there'll be the possibility to restore some kind of normal relationship with uh, the United States. So presumably you would want to encourage these instincts. What specifically would you say? Yeah. And as I told you before, I mean, this is the one place where I think there was a real qualitative difference between him and Hillary. And it's not that he's perfect or anything, but she is absolutely the worst on this. So we are really, uh, you know, should really be thankful and she's being deprived the opportunity to set our Russia policy from here forward, Tom. I really mean that in the most explicit kind of a way. Uh, she could have gotten us all killed, I think. And the, really the reason why, Mr. Trump, is because all of this is her husband's fault. In the 1990s, he launched NATO expansion just so that he could get the Polish vote in Illinois. And, you know, it's just domestic politics. And, and of course, there's also corporate welfare for Lockheed to get rid of a bunch of, you know, to standardize Eastern European militaries on American and NATO lines. So it's, it's the hugest corporate welfare check ever for for uh, Lockheed and Bruce Jackson. Their guy actually helped create the committee for NATO expansion to come up with excuses. The same guy that came up with the committee for the liberation of Iraq in 2002. Uh, Lockheed vice president. Anyway, um, and so they pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. And all the wisest graybeards then said, don't do this. And they did it. And Warren Christopher, who was the secretary of defense, who was a real genius wonk, kind of a, you know, national security uh, weirdo in there, Dr. Strangelove type. He said, oh, my, like, this is over his dead body. He did everything he could to try to stop Bill Clinton from doing this. And because what Mr. Kennan, in fact, George Kennan, who invented the containment theory back in the 40s, uh, he said, what's going to happen here is we are going to provoke a Russian reaction with expanding our NATO military alliance into their neighborhood. And then all the people who now are telling us, don't worry, it'll be fine, are going to be the exact same people saying, oh, look, Russian aggression. That's why we need NATO is to respond to Russian aggression, which is exactly what has happened. And so, um, you know, from Bill Clinton through George W. Bush and Barack Obama, all Virtually all problems between America and Russia are America's fault. Just full stop. And and George W. Bush brought in the Baltic states, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, which is directly on the Russian border. And he talked very loudly and, and had the rest of NATO talking very loudly about bringing Ukraine and Georgia into NATO as well. And the Russians had just, in fact, there's a WikiLeaks a State Department document. Is it a WikiLeaks? It's a State Department document where they say "nyet" means "nyet," and this is the American ambassador says, "Hey, so Putin made himself really clear that we better effing not 
you know, think seriously about doing Ukraine and NATO, that this is a red line and he means it uh, kind of a thing. And this is exactly the fire that they're playing with. And now in Ukraine, the USA has overthrown the government in Kiev twice in 10 years. And this is like if Russia overthrew the government in Canada twice. I mean, we would be we would go to war. Right. The USA would go to war. We wouldn't even screw around. That would be it. Um, and that's what we've done there. The Orange Revolution of 2004 and then the Maiden Revolution of 2014. This is all aided and abetted by the U.S. And they're caught red handed. The Russians intercepted their call and put it on YouTube. And there's Victoria Newland, Robert Kagan's wife, the assistant secretary of state for European affairs on the phone with Jeffrey Pyatt, the ambassador to Ukraine. And they're plotting the coup. It's as plain as day. You might remember the headline was F the EU because Victoria Newland used a bad word. And so CNN went, oh, tee hee hee, she used a bad word. But what was the conversation? The conversation was, hi, Jeffrey, it's me, Victoria, calling to plot the coup in Ukraine. And that was what they talked about the whole time. There's no question about it. They were picking the new government and talking about bringing in the vice president and a guy named uh, Mary from the United Nations to help glue this thing together and make it all happen. And they did it. And the head of Stratford, George Friedman, said this is the most obvious coup in world history. And uh, Ray McGovern and everybody else agrees so that's exactly what it was. And so when they did that, that's what provoked the Russian seizure of Crimea, which to them is like the Alamo times a million. They lost hundreds of thousands of men, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers died fighting the Nazis in Crimea in World War II. So... I, you know, I'm from Texas and the Alamo is a, it really is kind of a big deal, especially for people whose family go back a ways and whatever. We're talking a few dozen guys died there. OK. And they really had no business. They were trespassing. Uh, this is the Alamo times a million. Crimea is Russia's like Houston is America's. And um, basically, Khrushchev in a drunken fit in the middle of the night in the 40s, this communist dictator of the USSR had given it quote unquote, to Ukraine, but it didn't matter because everybody answered to the Kremlin anyway. And then I would note the Russians were perfectly happy leasing their naval base and having a peaceful agreement with Ukraine about that naval base at Sevastopol on Ukraine until America overthrew the government in Kiev for the second time. And at that point, they seized it. But despite what hype you might hear on TV about how Russia invaded Crimea, no one was killed. Not one person was killed. The only shots that were fired were over the heads of some Ukrainian soldiers who were told, you guys better turn around, pal. And that was the end of that. That's it. So, uh, yes, under international law, that's not supposed to be how you do it. But then again, it wasn't legal what America was doing in Kiev, overthrowing the government there either. And then Syria, we've talked about. But I, I think the bottom line in Syria is why did Russia finally directly intervene there? And it's because America was helping Al Qaeda seize the Idlib province, which put them in a position to directly threaten Damascus. And Putin finally said, that's it. You cross my line. I'm not going to help you help Al Qaeda put Jolani or Ayman al-Zawahiri on the throne in Damascus. Sorry. So it's all America's fault. Bill Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama's fault, 100 percent. I'll give Barack Obama partial credit for only being horrible and not getting us all killed, which he would have done if he had listened to his advisors who wanted to escalate and escalate and escalate in Ukraine and in, in Syria as well. We did an episode on Syria, you and I already, not too long ago, so I will link to that at TomWoods.com slash 781. So let's leave Syria to that episode. But let's say something in conclusion about drone warfare in general that's enjoyed bipartisan support. Even Bernie Sanders supports that. What can you say about that in terms of what its goals have been and what its actual fruits have been? All right. Well, part of the goal is to just kill suspects so that then there's not a question of what you got to do with these guys if you catch them somewhere. Uh, which is the big thing. And so it's a cheat. They say that they only use these things to go after Al-Qaeda and dangerous terrorists in places where they could not otherwise get them. But they're not trying to capture them. They're just trying to kill them. And that's been shown over and over. And the two most important cases, no, 
the two most important cases for the theory of U.S. law, not the two most important cases. The two most important cases for the theory of U.S. law are uh, Obama's drone murders of Anwar al and his son, Abdul Rahman, who was only a 16-year-old boy. Both of them American-born, American citizens, which actually doesn't matter. They're U.S. persons. They're 100% protected by the Bill of Rights, even when they travel overseas. And they could have been captured. Certainly the boy wasn't a terrorist at all. The boy was out looking for his father, full stop. He was not a terrorist in any sense. He was trying to stop his father uh, and bring him home. Um, And they just murdered him simply because he knew too much, apparently. In fact, you know, they say it was an accident. They were trying to kill the guy next to him. But John Brennan, the current head of the CIA, he was the head of counterterrorism in the White House at the time. And he said he didn't believe that. Well, then I don't either. Thank you very much. If, if he says I don't have to, then good. I think that they deliberately targeted him, and I think it was because he knew too much about his father's prior relationship with the FBI and who knows whatever else. I guess Empty Wheel probably knows. But, uh, you know, and this is, a whole new, this is a whole new thing, man, to have uh, an American uh, president uh, have American citizens assassinated by spies and or military force like that overseas and claim that it's legal, claim openly in the newspapers to have the authority to do it, as Obama has done. He should have been impeached and removed and convicted and sent to prison for murders. Simple as that. has no authority whatsoever to do that. I mean, you're the constitutional law guy. What the hell do I know? But anyway, um, in Pakistan... Uh, they did kill a lot of old CIA guys, but to what good? If, I mean, uh, pardon me, uh, old Al Qaeda, uh, core Al Qaeda guys. But to what good effect? I don't really know. I mean, it seems like a lot of them, if they didn't have safe haven in Pakistan, they fled home to Yemen and helped spread the Al Qaeda problem back to Yemen and back to Somalia and back to Libya um, and places like that. And at the same time that they were fighting the um, killing Al Qaeda guys in Pakistan. They made a deal with the Pakistani government to kill their enemies, too. Not the Afghan Taliban that America fights, but the Pakistani Taliban, which is a separate group and only has a beef with the with the Pakistani government. And so we got the U.S. got involved in that fight and ended up further destabilizing, only making the Pakistani Taliban more powerful and further destabilizing that state, which is really four countries just barely held together with military power and bubble gum and string and is sitting on a pile of nuclear weapons and is sitting next door to their avowed enemy state, India, that they fought, I think, for six wars with since the end of World War II era. So... Um, it's been incredibly dangerous, and, and the Pakistan-India border is the most dangerous place in the world right now, and the fight over Kashmir is, uh, you know, dollars to dimes that that's the next place there will be a, a nuclear exchange in anger uh, on the planet Earth will be there on that border, and America has done everything but try to negotiate some sort of just settlement and peace between India and Pakistan. Instead, we arm them both. And then certainly in the case of Pakistan, we bomb the hell out of it and destabilize the hell out of it, too. Um, And then I talked about the drone war in uh, Yemen and how I guess I left out how it really only made Al Qaeda more and more powerful the whole time they were bombing it. Now they're bombing it and fighting for it at the same time. Um, George Bush took a a local matter that had nothing to do with Al Qaeda and he turned it into an Al Qaeda linked insurgency in Somalia with his invasion of 2006. Uh, Christmas 2006, he hired the Ethiopians to invade Somalia. And they've turned that place upside down. And the war that they caused there, uh, they had extremely bad weather anyway. But there was no capitalism there, Tom, to ameliorate the effects of the famine because of the war. All the markets were closed. All the fields, you know, went fallow. Whoever did have a crop couldn't sell it to anybody. Nobody could travel. No one had any money. The entire system of distribution of food broke down and hundreds and hundreds, maybe a million people by now have starved to death there. And again, all because of America and their intervention. The drone, actual drone bombings are only a small part of that Somalia war, but uh, they are part of it. And they have time and time again killed innocent people, men, women, children, burned to death, bodies torn apart, uh, Worst kind of nightmare you could imagine at the hands of the Democrats there with their drones. And then, you know, Afghanistan has had a drone war as part of the air war in Afghanistan all along. And the war against the Islamic State in Iraq and in eastern Syria 
has uh, had a drone component all along too. The Air Force is, especially in Iraq, has been uh, absolutely bombing the Jesus out of them since uh, August of 2014. And in fact, airwars.org, there's a guy named Chris Woods who just does an incredible job of keeping track of all the casualties. And the numbers can be deceiving too because numbers are just numbers. But they're a clue to the amount of chaos and devastation that uh, America spreads around with these drones. And we got them, you know, now have whole new drone bases going in in Central Africa to help spread the Boko Haram problem around the insurgency based out of Nigeria there. So they just keep making, I mean, it's basically, it's like in Fantasia where um, the sorcerer's apprentice is, um, he's got the hatch and he's trying to, to cut up the brooms and, and basically to kill the brooms because they keep bringing in the pails of water and he doesn't know the spell to make them stop. But then every time he cuts them up, they just turn into more and more and more. And then they're bringing in more and more pails of water and flooding them even worse. And that's America's foreign policy right there with these drones, basically, is it seems like a useful tool today, but the consequences, I mean, never mind the morality of it, but in American statecraft terms, it seems like a useful tool. But then the blowback is always, um, oh, I could have mentioned um, uh, Zazi, who was... uh, uh, the following terrorist attacks are not FBI put-up jobs. Most of them are, but these aren't. Uh, Zazi, the Afghan who was living in Denver, was going to blow up some stuff in New York, uh, but got busted in the plot, thank goodness. The Times Square bomber, Faisal Shahzad, he was a Pakistani-American, naturalized citizen, had an advanced degree and a professional job and a big house and a wife and a life and an American dream uh, going on. He went home to Pakistan. He saw his neighborhood his, or his family where he's from, uh, their neighborhood devastated by American drone strikes. And he joined up the Pakistani Taliban. And they taught him how to make bombs. And luckily his was a big failure. Um, but that was the Times Square attack of 2010. Uh, before him was the underpants bomber who was blowback from the drone war going on in Yemen, who was sent by uh, one of the Al Qaeda guys there. And I'm sorry, I got more, but um, we, and in fact, Orlando, he invoked the drone war too. Uh, the Orlando shooter, Mateen did. You know, Scott, it occurs to me that it's a good thing I bothered to look at my notes here, that I might have actually skipped the most important thing, which is ISIS, because that's where Trump just goes all out. We just got to pound him. We need a, a military response. We, whatever. He's thinking in terms of that. In other areas, you can at least you can interpret some of what he says as favoring some kind of disengagement, but not here. So now let's say you've got his ear. What do you say to him about this? He says, look, these people are uncivilized. They're barbaric. They're terrible. They're causing all kinds of problems. And we got to go smash them. Why would you say that's not a good idea? Doesn't that seem, you know, they're, they are bad guys. So what's the problem? Well, I would say, you know, Mr. President, as you know, this is all George Bush and Barack Obama's fault and every bit of American intervention over there. And really, if you want to go back to Bush Sr., as you said, Mr. President, if we hadn't screwed around over there at all in the last 25 years, never mind 15, we'd be better off. And you're exactly right. All we can do is make things worse. And right now, it's literally a battle of 10 armies over there. And you got the Peshmerga, you have the YPG among the Kurds, two different major factions of Kurds fighting. You have the Iraqi Shiite army, the Iraqi Shiite militias. You have Iraqi Sunni militias and Iraqi Turkmen militias who are allied with the Turkish government, uh, who is also backing al-Qaeda guys in their war against Assad. But Assad is also uh, fighting his army against the Islamic State with help from Hezbollah and Russia and Iranian Quds Force. So what's that, 13 and so which sides are we supposed to take in this thing and and against which and when and for how long in a row before we have to stop and stab our new ally in the back and turn him back over to the tender mercies of our enemies again or whatever it is. The whole thing is an absolute disaster. And by the way, the Islamic State is already dead and gone anyway. They, they're they losing Mosul right now. And even if if Barack Obama called off the air power this instant, the bat it's still on. I mean, they're basically nothing but a militia anyway and on the run as it is. They're going to lose Mosul, and then very quickly they're completely surrounded by enemies in Raqqa, 
and then they're back to being a militia again. And if anybody thinks that an American occupation can just fight off Sunni insurgencies until one day they all just go away or something like that, I'll remind you that we've seen this movie before, uh, just in the last decade, and it doesn't work that way. And so the thing is, it's always a good time to stop intervening in Iraq. I don't want to, there is no one last intervention. There is no, okay, just two more weeks of this and then we'll stop. Just stop. Because everything we can do is just like a government intervention in the economy. All you're doing is creating a a distortion that's going to end up blowing back. Let it be their problem. Say sorry, by all means, one billion apologies for George Bush and Barack Obama and everything they ever did to you guys. But now, our best way to make it up to you is to just stop that is should be the trumpian foreign policy for iraq and syria all right so those are so we've talked about some countries talked about islamic state talked about the drones but what about just the overall picture the overall american empire project here's a guy who claims to be a nationalist and he's opposed to globalism maybe he'd be receptive to a scott horton anti-empire message what would that message be Yeah. Well, I mean, I would try to phrase it to him, you know, the way a right wing nationalist would like to hear it. A right wing nationalist is never afraid to get into a war if he has to. Come on, let's go kick some butt and all of that. But all this do gooderism isn't worth it. And that's the way the Libya or pardon me, the uh, Syria war, the full scale Syria attack in 2013 was stopped, was attacks from the right. And you know what? I really can't stand this, but it's true that. American conservatives said, we're selfish. We don't want to launch a war to help those lousy Syrians. Screw them. We're, you know, we're not going to do them the favor of invading their country for them. And, you know, it's stupid, but I guess whatever. I, if I have to say my lines and I'll say, Donald Trump, shouldn't we stop wasting our money helping people by burning them all to death like this and turning their societies upside down and inside out. Uh, Why in the world would anyone think that the middle part of North America should be the dominant force in the Middle East, in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, in the Pacific Ocean, in the heart of Africa? where the army is now moving with their massive special forces pivot there since they're left out of the Pacific pivot. And, you know, it's a government program, the army. Um, It's crazy. And also it's a betrayal, frankly, of the people who sign up to fight uh, for this country in the military, who almost all are, you know, broadly speaking, right wing nationalists like Donald Trump, who believe that they are fighting one to protect Americans lives and or two their freedom somehow from threats, but who do not sign up to be the armed sociologists of the world out there performing experiments in better governments in other people's societies. And when they get their legs and their genitals blown off on a mission out there riding a Humvee around in some godforsaken valley none of us will ever hear of in Afghanistan on the far side of the world, on exile, on the, on the far side of the planet Earth from here, um, it's, a, it's stabbing them in the back. You know, if we're if we're taking care of our soldiers and supporting our troops and all of that, then that means the the civilian part of the government and it means the democracy part of the society, the American adults who approve or disapprove of these things, that we live up to our promise to the military people that we will only put them in harm's way when it's absolutely necessary. That we're not going to throw their life away because Hillary prefers this Shiite mili- or this Sunni militia to that Shiite one, or vice versa, depending on the country. And so that I think is you know a good way to attack the empire from the right. That Dick Cheney, you know, he says deficits don't matter, but that's just not true. And it's also not true that we can be a free and a great country here. At the same time, we're trying to be a great empire around the world. Those entire concepts are at enemies and at loggerheads with each other. Unless the people between San Diego, California, and Bangor, Maine all just exist to be, you know, fodder, tax fodder, and and cannon fodder for an empire. But 
we thought the deal was we're born free and we allow this government to exist to protect our rights, to protect us. And that's it. And so if intervening in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Mali and Nigeria and Iraq again and Syria and Ukraine, for Christ's sake, all up in the grill of Vladimir Putin where we don't belong. If uh, I forgot how I started that sentence, but all that clearly is weakening us, is putting us in a uh, in an untenable position for the long term. And it's a gigantic waste of trillions of dollars. And, you know, the thing is, the reality is that Donald Trump is not really any sort of libertarian at all or even really a Pat Buchananite because that would at least imply that he reads and stuff like that. And the thing is, Tom, he said before in his uh, his big foreign policy speech, he was actually introduced by uh, original uh, uh, neoconservative Zalme Khalilzad. And he said he began his speech by saying America is overextended, overextended, I tell you. And so but here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn the American economy around so that we can afford to be overextended. And then it won't be quite so over. It'll just be extended and it'll be great. And that's what Donald Trump thinks is greatness is really the same thing that William Crystal thinks is greatness, what they call primacy or hegemony. And it just means imperial domination. And as they put it, quite frankly, Zalmay Khalilzad actually helped write up the, def- the defense plan and guidance in 1992 that said we will build such a powerful world empire that no one will ever even consider trying to challenge us. It would be too expensive and we would bomb them before they got anywhere even near started trying to build up a military that could oppose ours. And, you know, never mind the nukes in the world out there, but That's what they're trying to do, and that's why the constant demonization of Russia and the constant demonization of China and of Iran and, for that matter, of Cuba and North Korea, because it doesn't matter whether they're powerful or whether they're little guys, no one is allowed to tell America no ever or we'll kill you and we'll starve your people to death. We will bomb them to death, and that is our game. And, you know... I don't know what Trump thinks America really is, but if he thinks it's a place and not the title of a military force, then, you know, I don't know. He, he's not from DC. So it's, it's possible that somebody could get through to him with these type of talking points. I don't know. I'm sure there, there's somebody who could say it in, in more of a right wing way than me to try to get him to get it. But you know, the, the, real, the real problem here is the realization that we all have, right, is that he's not even smart enough to know that he needs to be talking to our friends at Cato, like Ted Carpenter and Doug Bandow, who are both, you know, could get a security clearance, right, who could be the national security advisor or the secretary of state. He's not talking to Andrew Bacevich. He's not talking to Paul Pilar or the guys at the National Interest uh, magazine. He doesn't even know who these guys are. He doesn't even read Daniel Larrison. He doesn't even read Pat Buchanan. I mean, if you were Donald Trump, isn't it the one thing you would read is Pat? He doesn't even read Pat. He doesn't know anything. And so you you stick him with somebody like James Woolsey or, God forbid, they're talking about bringing in Stephen Hadley, the guy that funneled the Niger uranium forgeries into the pipeline to start the Iraq war. They're talking about bringing him on maybe to be secretary of defense or something. I mean, personnel is policy. That's what they say. And that's absolutely true. Look at the first Bush junior administration. As I said, the way uh, Dick Cheney set up that separate government and what they were able to accomplish to, to no good end. Yeah. It seems like, it seems like an awful lot of trouble to go to just to want to change things by 4%. You know, I mean, that's what that sort of team would amount to. We'll change foreign policy by about 4%, and that's about what it should be, instead of the total overhaul that we obviously need, and that in his more lucid moments, Trump seems to be groping toward. But then he turns around, and he's got Bolton and uh, Woolsey and horrible people around him, and he's calling them great guys and Tom Cotton, and these are wonderful people. These are not wonderful people. Did you hear? Are you listening to the other sentences that you're uttering and then contrasting them with what these people say? Right. It, very. So you went to all this trouble so that you could get some some more right wing hangers on 
into the Washington power structure? Like that was what it was for? Really? Right. And, I, you know, I really like highlighting Bandau because, you know, Bandau speaks in Donald Trump's language as far as don't, don't misunderstand me, Doug. I, I don't mean the one syllable thing. I mean, the part about our allies are a bunch of free riders. And what are we really getting out of this? It's not just imperial domination. They're all a bunch of welfare dependents. And let's look at that end of it. Right. That's more of a. Uh, conservative or right-leaning, a, a right-based um, opposition to the empire. And that goes along, that coincides with what Trump says about the Germans and the rest of them in Europe um, and, and the Asian allies as well. Why are we still paying their bills, he asks all the time. And so Bandau is basically Trump, only brilliant, right? Bandau thinks the same things, only you read his articles in Forbes and you go, wow, this guy's really an expert on all this stuff. And he literally used to work for Ronald Reagan. So he has just a great resume. He's just brilliant. He, he would be a perfect national security advisor. Um, and Ted Carpenter at Cato also is absolutely great. And again, could get the job, you know, presumably could pass the clearance, no problem, and I think could be a secretary of state. Paul Pilar, who is very, very sorry he lied us into a, uh, Iraq War II. Uh, he could be the head of the CIA, or he could be, you know, somebody important on the National Security Council to try to protect Trump from the crazies. Paul Pilar, I need you to protect me from the crazies. I want you to be my deputy national security advisor. How hard is that? And yet he's never even heard of Paul Pilar. That's the part that's really killing me here because I think, I think those guys probably would say yes if he offered them the job. And I think that, that actually, Tom, there's only about a handful of guys who are good on this stuff and who could get the job, who could qualify for the job. And it, so in other words, it would be very easy for Trump to figure out what I have just told you. And yet he's not going to be able to. He's going to his son-in-law is going to pick his cabinet for him. Then then list it out. Let's list it out. Give me the half dozen people that realistically now it's it's plausible that he could choose. All right. So I would say Bandau for national security advisor, Carpenter for secretary of state, Pilar for head of the CIA. And Basevich, which I know Basevich wouldn't do it, but we're fantasizing here anyway. Basevich for Secretary of Defense, and could there um, could there be a role for a Jim Webb anywhere? Hmm, possibly. He's a Democrat. That would be you know reaching across the aisle. Yeah, yeah. No, maybe find a place for him on the National Security Council or something like that. Um, I could maybe see that or or. You know, I don't know, man. He's a wishy-washy kind of guy. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I, I just read something horrible about him the other day, in fact, but I can't remember what it is, so I can't say it. Okay, okay. Um, All right, well, these, I mean, these are good people. I mean, I'd be, I would be thrilled. I mean, you and I have nits to pick with each of these people, but for oh, heaven's sure. sake, we, you know, yeah. I would take them. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, Paul Pilar, you know, he really did lie us into war with Iraq, but you know what? He's pretty damn good, too. And, you know, over at the National Interest, there are probably a few more names I'm not thinking of. But there are a couple of writers from the National Interest. And, you know, probably I would like Stephen Walt um, or, and John Mer uh, Mearsheimer, the, who are the realists. But they're politically radioactive because oh, yeah, they no wrote way. the book yeah. The Israel Lobby. Right. But um, when I had Stephen Walt on, on, the, on my show, and I'm sure you've had – have you had him on your show? Yeah, yeah. I talked yeah, to him. Yeah, he, he joked about how he – he decided to write this book when he decided that he was quite content not ever having a government job after that. Right. <laughs> then yeah. he decided, okay, I guess I can go ahead and write the book. Yeah, and you know, that's going to be a big problem for Donald Trump, too, is because he doesn't know nothing about nothing. And it's funny to hear peacemongers try to give him all this credit for saying that he would like to negotiate a deal in Palestine or something like that. He doesn't know the first thing about nothing. He doesn't know what the West Bank is a bank of at all. He doesn't know if it's a... A bank with an ATM, or if it is, it, is that a bank of a river? What river? He doesn't know anything. He, he just heard that that would be a great success of a deal because what a big white whale of a deal to get is something over there they're fighting over in the Middle East or whatever. But then everybody read him the Riot Act and said, hey, stop acting like Palestinians or humans and have rights or anything like that. And he said, oh, okay, sorry, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll move the embassy to Jerusalem. The universal, eternal, undivided capital of Israel. You know, so, 
Um, I think that anybody who had their hopes up that he was going to be any kind of fair broker when it comes to the occupations in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and in East Jerusalem are are going to be sorely disappointed, although it can't it can't have been very many people convinced themselves to believe in that. But what happened was when he said, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with being even handed. All the neocons completely freaked out. So then when the neocons completely freaked out, that made it seem like there was really some substance to what he had said. But it wasn't really. He just likes land deals. You know what I mean? He didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is that I think we're inclined to think if the neocons are upset about something, that's because there's real substance. And yeah. The but neo- it's not like yeah, he but the, has a real position about yeah, Palestine well, and, course, and those guys deserve their own state someday or whatever. Right, no, know. what we need to remember is that the neocons go ballistic over nothing. Over the tiniest little grain of sand out of place, they go ballistic. So it doesn't mean that Trump is is like Pat Buchanan or something. Right. It just means the neocons are extremely paranoid and they go completely overboard. So anyway, listen, we've we've covered what I think we should cover. Um, oh gosh, we've been going on forever. <laughs> okay, hey, just, you can I just you can edit clock. my longer answers no, too. No, why the heck would I do that? Right? It's, it's well, I don't know, man. I do go on and on. I know. Yeah, but I let you go because I look. You, you can you can teach this stuff, and when you're on the show, I like to just sit back and let you talk to the audience, and and that's what we did today. So. That's the stuff. Now, what you, of course, need to do... Um, and oh, wait, can I tell you the worst thing about what happened yesterday? Tell me the worst thing. When, and by the way, yesterday, bear in mind, this isn't going to run till Friday. Well, yeah, I mean, on Election Day there, Tuesday. Well, first of all, the best thing was Hillary Clinton lost. Ha, ha. But the worst thing that happened was other Hillary Clinton won. Liz Cheney. And Tom, I'm here to tell you, man... You might even put in sound effects there, like dun, dun, dun. Uh, She is the most dangerous person in America now. She's only in the House of Representatives, but I wouldn't sell her short. She's as smart as a whip. She's as evil as her father. She's a true believer. You know, she writes the books. He tells her what to say. She writes the books. Um, She is 100% daddy's girl, and she's only like 50 or something. And we're going to be stuck with her for the rest of our lives. She's in the House now. She'll be in the Senate in two or four years or whenever the next uh, Wyoming Senate race is. And then we are all just doomed. She's never going away. She's guaranteed to be absolutely horrible on every single thing, no matter what. And effectively. I mean, she'll be the chair of the committee in no time. I'm telling you, man. It's on. On. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that everybody had to hear that, but it needs to be I am known, too. right? I, yeah. I hate being the bearer of bad news, but I've been carrying this thing around on my shoulders. It's weighing me down, I tell you. Yeah. That, well, let's just say you've learned to cope with being the bearer of bad news, right? You've, you've, <laughs> yeah, okay. You know? Okay. All right. I want people to make sure and visit Scott in particular at libertarianinstitute.org, which is a very worthy project that is deserving of your support. So do check out libertarianinstitute.org. Thanks. And Scott, thanks for our chat today. Let's get you back on. We'll talk about one thing at a time next time. That sounds good. All right, good. Thank you very much for having me, Tom. All right, that's it for today. But make sure, even if you're not a regular listener of my other podcast, Contra Krugman, which releases an episode every week, make sure and listen to this week's episode Coming out this weekend, it's episode number 60, and it's David Stockman joining us as a guest on that show. David Stockman was the director of the Office of Management and Budget under Ronald Reagan, and he's become absolutely outstanding. He's, in terms of the bailouts, he had the best, most powerful arguments against them, both before and after, and he he wants to abolish the Federal Open Market Committee. I mean, this is uh, This is... Hardcore stuff. And he's going to be talking about Trump and what he ought to do and all all this great stuff. I mean, this is the sort of person Trump ought to be listening to. If he knew what he was doing, he'd be listening to somebody like David Stockman. So we're going to be talking to David Stockman on Contra Krugman. So watch for that episode. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.